Good evening. We greet you in the name which is above every name, that is the name of Jesus the Christ. As we come today, we do thank you for tuning in with us for our weekly Bible study. We pray that all is well where your families are concerned and that God is truly blessing you. We pray for all those who are in position to help, those who are uh, our first responders and all those who are called to, to help us in times like these, that they will in turn be blessed. And we know that sometimes even from hearing from all the nurses and all the people that have to do so much, it sometimes not only is physically draining, but it becomes uh, mentally draining. And that's a tide by which, you know, you can't immediately get over. But our prayer is that God will continue to bless them through this pandemic as they labor for us on the front line of emergency. We want to thank you again, as I said, for, for, for joining in with us. And as our uh, weekly study have been, we've been talking about United by Grace in 2020. I wanted to take the opportunity uh, today, and the, the Lord led us to, to understand that, you know, speaking to our, our leadership, and when we speak to leaders, we're speaking to anyone, whether you're a leader of a family, a uh, leader of, of a church, and you're called to be a leader, but we're speaking to anyone that has the leadership ability. And what we've been doing from our leadership standpoint, we've been studying uh, from the book on being a leader for God. Uh, we did set aside some time earlier this year uh, to study chapter number eight in the book, but we did not get to an opportunity to get together. So today we want to take this opportunity and discuss some things that come out of chapter eight in the book on being a, a leader for God. It comes from the scripture, Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30. And before we go into that, let us bow in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this blessed opportunity that you have given us as, Lord, your children to come and look into your eternal word. We realize, Father, that the flower fadeth and the grass withereth, but, Lord, your word shall last forever. Lord, it is our prayer, Father, as we look into your eternal word, that, Father, Lord, our excitement and our enthusiasm, Lord, will showcase, Lord, to others, Lord, how excited we are about this word and that all children of God should be about the word of God because it gives us precious promises, dear Father, that will endure tough times. We ask, dear Father, that, Lord, you bless the listening audience with an ear to hear what thus saith the Lord and minister to their spirit. Dear Father, that they won't give up, they won't faint in times like these, but dear Father, that they'll grow stronger in your will and stronger to know that you're working things out for their good. My prayer, Father, today is that, Lord, you cover us by your grace. Continue, Lord, to unite us as one, Father, with the simple purpose of glorifying you. Now, as we go forth into this word, Father, we pray that, Lord, you will, Lord, help us to extract all that we need out of this word. And that, Lord, we'll be better servants for you. In Christ Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. As I said, we, we thank you and we pray that something will be said and done by the unction of the Holy Spirit that will aid you in your journey as a Christian. And if you do not know the Lord, we pray that at, by, the end of this, uh, by the end of this session of Bible study, that you will want to open up your heart. And allow the Lord Jesus to have a relationship with you, and that Lord you and that you will see the need to have a relationship with Him. Today, as I said, we are talking about uh, the book on being a leader for God, by, written by Warren Wiersbe. Uh, from chapter number eight, uh, we do draw the understanding that it talks about ability, ability, ability. From Webster's point of view, says is the quality or state of being able, competent in accomplishing a specific goal with skills of mental and physical awareness, the ability, fitness, or likeness to act or be acted on in any particular way. And as I said, our scripture is coming from Matthew, the 25th chapter, and let us read from the 
verses 14 through verse 30, it says, Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had two talents had two. He also gained other two. But he that had received one went and dig in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with, with them. And he, and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, well done. That's good. That's a, that's a good thing to say. That's a good thing to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said unto, said, Lord, thou hast deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, well done. Good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy, thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. And lo, there thou hast, thou hast thy, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I uh, sow not, and gather what I have not strawed. Thou ought therefore to have put my money to exchanges. And then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take, therefore, the talent from him and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, for he shall have abundance. But him from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant unto outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what I've read from the 14th through the 30th verse of the 25th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. It lays out the understanding of ability. And, and I like what it says here. And, and the key to this, to this is not all the exchanges of the talents, but you look right here in verse Number 15, it says, and unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. As I read to you a few minutes ago from uh, Webster's understanding of what ability means, in the book in chapter number 8, it says Warren Wiersbe, who wrote the book, defines ability in chapter number eight as the power to turn opportunities into accomplishments and gain something good from the transaction. I gotta read, I gotta say that again. The power to turn opportunities into accomplishments and gain something good from the transaction. How many of you ever spent money on something that you thought was going to be good, but at the end of the transaction, you found out it didn't do what it was supposed to do? That wasn't a good transaction because you were expecting something good out of it. So when I look at where it says several ability or gave them according to their several ability, 
That means he knew what to expect out of them. He expected more out of them than what he, what he had given them according to their seven ability. And sometimes we cheat God when we tell others that we've done the best we could. How do, you know, sometimes we don't even know what is our best. I found out years ago that my best teachers, my best mentors were people who I thought were just mean to me. They were, that they were just, just out and out mean people. But I found out that they were striving to get the best out of me. And to get the best out of me, they had to push me, push me to my limits, push me beyond the limits of what I was capable of so I, they could get the best out of me. Only God knows what is your best. Can I say that one more time? Only God knows what is your best. Sometimes we can even fool our own self and think we did our best when we didn't do our best. What we did, we tried to explain to ourselves, you did the best you could. No, you didn't do the best you could. You, ain't done, you haven't done the best you could until God was well pleased and knew that you did your best. So that's why we got to look at this word several ability, according to your ability. What are you capable of? What is your limit? What what is what are you capable of going to and across to get to your uh, exact purpose? When we look at it, the and when we look in the book, and, and I like what he says right here in the book, in that second in that second paragraph, it says the first two servants receive identical commendations. That's verse number twenty one and twenty three, but the third man was called wicked and lazy and was disciplined that's verse number 26 and 30 he had gained on he had gained only one bag more he that had gained only one bag more he could have gained another bag if he had gained another bag then he would have been promoted because of the proportion you see when you look at the five he gained other five when you look at the two, he gained other two. But the one that had just the one talent, he didn't gain anything by it. What, what, what the, the, the Lord of the servants were, he was looking for more than what he gave them. And God knew, God knows what he had placed within us. And to extract that and give him any less, we're telling God, no, I, I can't give no more. And God said, yes, you can give more. You can be more productive. So I'm looking at this that when you when you look at it, I like what it said, what he wrote right here. It said when he would have qualified for the same promotion that the other two did, because the promotion is dependent on proportion. I say that again. Promotion is dependent on proportion. That means if you only got one and you gained one, then you've got a hundred percent return. But when you didn't get nothing for your for your journey and you hid what 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 was not yours anyhow, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to that in just a minute. When you hid what was not yours, then you really could have, you know, gained somebody if you just put it to usury, you know, put it to the exchanges so that you can get something, draw some interest from it. So when I look at it, each ability we have is a gift from God who determined, listen who determine and supervise the weaving together of our person before we were born. I read the scripture coming from the first chapter of Jeremiah a couple of weeks ago where God told Jeremiah, he said, before you were formed in the womb, before, you know, you ever, you know, nobody ever knew you, but I knew you. He said, not only did I know you, but I ordained you and I called you to be a prophet. So God knows our ability. He knows our makeup. So when you begin to, when you come into the point of, of salvation, when you come into the family of God, it is a good thing to understand purpose. And you understand what God's purpose is for you. So that you can be in a hurry to get to where you can maximize your gift. And I look at this and I wrote down each ability we have is a gift from God. That's good to know right there because you didn't do it. 
And I look at all the, the people that have extraordinary ability. Uh, I look at the Michael Jordans of our world, who they talk about today, the Michael Jordans of our world. They, you know, the, the people who have the ability to do a lot of great things, they've been graced for that. God has blessed them with grace. And they can't take no credit for it because others can't do what they do. But God just has just graced them for it. Don't you go hating on them. Don't you go talking about them. But God has graced them for that. You know what? God has graced you for some stuff that you can do and you alone. Can't nobody else do what you do. God has graced you for that. And as God has graced you, define your understanding of what your ability is and go the, get the maximum out of it. So when I, when I look at this, I like what it says right here because it helps us to understand that even in our gifts, those are, are defined as things that come from God. Our spiritual gifts come from God. Our ability to be grace and be, you know, beyond measure. Some of us can take more than others. Some of us can stand up on a very heavy load and still smile. Why? Because you've been driven to your point and you've and God is maximizing your ability. He's maximizing what he can get out of you. And sometimes we when when we get a little hangnail, some folk want to cry about it. But God has graced some of us to go through and if you look at them, they don't look like they've been through too much. But you really don't know their story until they get down and start telling you all the things that could have killed them, that would have killed them, had it not been for the grace of God. That's why we got to understand what is your ability? What has God placed in you or graced you for that it would have took somebody else out? But God graced you for it. That's why you're able to stand here and smile about it today. When we look at it, and I'm glad he goes on to say, on page number 51 in our book on being a leader for God, he said leaders must, dis must discover their abilities and gifts as soon as possible and use them in the power of the Spirit for the glory of the Lord. When God allows you to go through something, it's not only just for you, but it's for others too. To sit back and look and, and say, Lord, I, I thank you for showing me through sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so that even though it may look hard, they still got a smile on their face and they've been graced to go through what they're going through. And needless to say, bring something good. We, we talked about it a few minutes ago. Bring something good out of this transaction. Out of something bad, there's got to be some good to come out of it. Can I say that again? I learned in my favorite scripture, which is Romans 8 and 28, and it says, And we know all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. So whatever God has purposed in you, guess what? He's graced you for in such a time as this. Don't, you may shed a few tears. You may go through some things. But understand this. Whatever God allows to come your way, he's graced you for it. And not only that, but he's graced you to a point where there is a way of escape and that you're able, be able to bear up under the load. So I'm thankful that even when we look at leaders today, and that's why we got to be careful to pray for, especially our church leaders, uh, the ones who are striving to, to minister to our, our soul, minister to us in, in, in such a way that our spirit man is uplifted. Now, we can go and, and, and ask people to speak to our natural man, but the natural man is what's perishing. we got to speak to that spirit man. And once we speak to the spirit man, the spirit man is the one that's engaged and can grow a little bit more. So that covers the first two pages of it, of, on being a leader for God. And we turn over to page number 52, uh, of which it says in that little corner, it says, nobody is happier than the people who know themselves, accept themselves and their abilities, and then and give themselves to the Lord to serve Him as He sees fit. Not like you want to see, not like you see fit, but that He sees fit. Some, you know, somebody is glorifying God today, not because they they have all their bills paid, not because they have money in their pocket, not because they ride around in a good car. But they're glorifying God that he sustains them, even through all they've been through. 
Nobody is happier people than people who not only know themselves, but they accept themselves. How do you feel about yourself today? Do you feel that you've accomplished a lot and you feel good about what God has placed within you? Not only that, but he wants to take you a lot higher. He wants to take you to another realm by which you've never seen before, but he wants to take you higher. But you've got to be em embrace the you of today so that you can go into tomorrow. And when you embrace the you of today, then you're telling God, I accept what you know the calling that you've already placed on my life. Not only do I accept it, but I accept your purpose. So when we look at it, nobody is happier than the people who know themselves, who know what, who know the, the road that they're on, that God has planned this out. And needless to say, I'm going to give him glory. And when we when we go down to that, that bottom part, it said, it's not where you start. It's not where you start, but where you finish. Joseph served his father. Joseph was his, he served his master in Egypt. Joseph was, you know, he served the chief in the prison, as well as other inmates, but was promoted to second in command after he went through all this. Every leader that you see in the Bible, especially from the Old Testament, they started out at a low level. And, and the key to all this is humility. How well are you able to take what has been given to you, not fight back, but be humble and submissive in the lot that has been given to you? I see a lot of people that measure success today in the natural by uh, the accolades and all the stuff that they have, the stuff around them. But sometimes the, the greatest people that you ever meet in life are those who are able to persevere those who are able to stand under the load and still come out with a smile on their face and say, Lord, I thank you that I didn't lose my mind in all that I went through. So when I, when I look at this, it's not where you start at, but it's where you finish. I got to get this message across even to our people today because there are those uh, of the older generation, they've been through where we got to go. But to our younger people, it's not where you start at, but it's where you finish. And when you finish into a point where you finish better than you thought you'd ever, where you'd ever be, then you ought to thank God for where he allowing you to finish and not faltering in the midst of it. When we look at Moses, Moses started out as a baby in the bush. He started out as a babe who was subject and decreed by the Pharaoh to die. He said that he was, he was to die, but his mother hid him. And God showed favor in the midst. The emancipator that should have been killed was hidden on the river Nile. I heard C.L. Uh, C. Franklin, a, a great preacher, preach years ago. He said the, uh, the uh, alligators, the crocodiles couldn't bite them and the river couldn't, couldn't sink them. For the simple fact, he was God's man. And when you are God's person, when you are God's person, let me say that again. When you are God's person, don't worry about the crocodiles. Don't worry about the river. Don't worry about how deep the oceans is. But just know God put you there for a reason. And it's there just to give him glory. We see the outcome of Moses not only being a, a babe sitting on the Nile River, but the daughter of Pharaoh came and got him out. The daughter of Pharaoh raised him, and he was raised in the one who decreed that he should be dead. But I'm looking at this, that the final outcome was that he stood up for his own people and was called a murderer because he killed the Egyptian. But needless to say, after he took off and ran, God found him on the backside of the desert. I'm getting happy about this right now. He found him on the backside of the desert and spoke to him through a burning bush to let him know, I'm not through with you yet. <laughs> I'm not through with you yet. Needless to say, I want to use you to go back and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And when he told him that, Moses made every excuse like you did. All of us made excuses. All of us have made excuses why we can't do nothing. But God knew what was in him. God said, I want you to go back and tell him. And then Moses said, well, when I go back and tell him, who am I saying that sent me? God said, just tell him that I am, that I am sent you. And that'll be enough. I am God. 
So when I look at it, Moses started out in meager circumstances. Don't you ever despise your humble beginnings. Don't ever get to a point where you look down on where you are. The greatest time, I was telling my wife, the greatest time I ever had was when, when I started out in ministry. And I thought I was going to save the world. But I went to a little old place called Sandy Creek Baptist Church. And they didn't have a six members and two of them were deacons. And when I look at it, that was the best time because that formulated my understanding from that part of ministry. God said, now he had mercy on me then. God took me even in that, that we were able not only to, you know, I had to learn how to hammer nails. We had to nail up some paneling, had to clean the church. I had to clean it. I, I ain't mad. We had to clean the church. We had to prepare. It. Then I had to preach to them. But then in that, I learned that God said, if you're humble in the small stuff, whew, if you're humble in the small stuff, I'll bless you in the great stuff. So I get excited when I see the plot that God had for me. And he had some stuff that you can tell a story to yourself. That if you humble yourself, I'll bring you through some stuff. And show you where I can bring you if you just humble yourself. I, I, I get excited about that. But I, I got to understand that God has a way of showing us that he is in control of this. All along the way, it hasn't been easy. But I thank God it was worth it. Everything that I've been through, it was for my good. And it helped me to be the person that I am today. To be able to take a lick it. And keep on ticking because God's been good to me. And I say that with no reservation. I wouldn't do anything over again because what he brought me through, he showed me that he was in control of it. And as he's in control of it, I don't worry about the small stuff. I learned not to sweat the small stuff. But understand, he's in control of this. And for the haters that, that along the way, those who, who tried to take the thing away from me, who tried to make ministry hard for me, God dealt with them. And he bought me out good, on time, every time. And I say that to God's glory, because he's the one in control of this. When I look at it, I like what he says right here on page number 53. I got to get the tears out because I feel pretty good about that. Is that true leaders don't push themselves forward. They serve God faithfully and let him prepare them for what he has planned for them. Leaders don't pry the door open. They pray the door open. They pray and wait patiently for God's timing. Don't you ever try to push your way into nothing. Don't you ever try to, to, to pay your way into something. Whatever you did to get it, that's what you're going to have to keep on doing to maintain it. If God, ha God has a way of opening some doors for you that you haven't seen yet, and if you just wait on him and humbly submit yourself to him, he'll open the door when he gets ready. And when he gets ready and bring you through that open door, guess what? Nobody can shut that door but him alone. And nobody can get to a point. I'm glad he done shut some doors on me. I thought that I was supposed to go through that door. No, he shut the door so I wouldn't have no way of going through it. But there are doors that he has opened. And I thank him for it because he helps us to understand that it's all about him. So when I look at it, he knows how to place us and where to place us to maximize our potential, to maximize our potential. He wants the maximum out of you. And to get the maximum out of you, he has to take you through this some things. Now, when I say potential, potential is the existing possibility, capability of development into actuality, ability to turn vision into reality. I'm going to say that again. The ability to turn vision into reality. God gives us the vision. Just like he gave Joseph the vision of his brothers bowing down. 
He didn't turn, he didn't, God didn't turn him into reality then. But what he had to do was allow God to be God.